Okay, thanks everyone for coming to today's seminar. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Lee Hartman from University of Michigan. So he is currently a Leo Goldberg Collegiate Professor uh, since 2005, uh, and he was my PhD advisor, as some of you may know. And before he decided to come to Michigan, he spent almost 30 years at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics from 1976 to 2005, and he got his PhD in astronomy at University of Wisconsin at, uh, in 1976. So he has done... <laughs> well, that's just a number. <laughs> well... <laughs> Yeah, so he has tremendous work even before I was born <laughs> on a lot of different things, but mostly star formation, planet formation, and you know, starting from molecular cloud size to uh, stars themselves, like pre-main sequence stars, t tauri stars, and also disks around those young stars, which we call protoplanetary disks or circumstellar disks, and how material moves through the disks and how things are created onto the star and make planets. And he also has his favorite, F. Orionis. Are you going to talk about that a little bit? I'll, I'll mention it. I have to. OK, so I'll leave it for you. And also, he wrote a book, a textbook, which is titled Accretion Processes in Star Formation, which I still look for some equations from his book. <laughs> And he was also a vice president of WAS, Astronom uh, American Astronomical Society, uh, from 2007 to 2000, 2010. Okay, so I guess I will leave it there. And thank you for coming, Lee. Okay, thanks. Let's see, is this functional? Okay, uh, well, thanks for the invitation. It's been a long time since I've been here. Um, I know this is a mixed audience, and so, uh, but, so if, if you have, if I'm being really unclear just due to jargon or something like that, and you actually care, uh, you know, please feel free to, to, to stop me and, and uh, ask questions. That makes it more interesting. So this is work uh, that I've done with uh, uh, Fabian Heitch, a, a, grad, a grad student, Alexandra Kuznetsova at Michigan, and uh, Jahan really hadn't completely escaped my clutches. Uh, for some of this work. So what I want to talk about, um, actually mostly what I want to talk about is um, <clears throat> the masses and mass distributions of the of protoplanetary disks, of the disks that make planets. And, and I'm going to get at this in kind of an indirect way, but it's really sort of necessary because we, we have poor constraints on this. And so I'm going to start out trying to use the mass transport through the disks as a, as a clue, first of all, uh, for how much mass there is in, in, in the things that are going to make planets, and secondly, for the, for the transport rates. So the reason that I want to talk about accretion is that it gets at gas mass reservoirs. Uh, much of our estimates of masses of protoplanetary disks come from millimeter dust emission. And that's a pretty indirect measure of how much gas there is, particularly as we don't really know what the dust opacities are. Uh, and so then that leads into kind of talking about mass transport, which then leads into some thoughts about what the surface density structure in the disk might be. So not just how much mass there is, but where is it? And at what radius is it? Uh, and then at the end, if I have some time, uh, I want to talk about uh, some work that's in progress, which basically is thinking about, you know, the disks just don't appear from nowhere. There's a, there's a, there's a collapse process of gas and dust, which not only forms the star, but forms the disk. And so depending on how that uh, occurs, uh, you can get much different kinds of behavior uh, and much different protoplanetary disk structure in principle uh, using more realistic models of how, this, how the collapse goes. So, so that's, that's kind of the overview of this, and I'll, I'll see if I can get there. 
Okay, so this is our picture of accretion onto young stars, to like a solar type star that's something like one or two million years old. So we have a disk over here, and we forget about the wind for now. So we got a disk, and stuff comes from the disk, and it lands on the star. Okay, and a star like the sun or, or somewhat smaller stars have pretty strong magnetic fields, and so they truncate the disk. And so what happens is that as the stuff comes in from the disk, it actually flows along the uh, magnetosphere and crashes onto the star. So you could think of this as like a giant prominence that's several stellar radii, uh, kind of a we can see evidence, uh, we, can, we can watch this stuff kind of fall in. So it kind of comes in at a couple hundred kilometers per second, typically it crashes into the star. Uh, it makes x-rays, the x-rays get absorbed, and, and then you get some kind of excess emission. So the, the kinetic energy of the infall is being radiated away. And it's typically in uh, <clears throat> kind of the optical to UV, uh, and a typical temperature of this stuff is like, 8, 000, like an 8,000 degree black body, although it's not quite a black body. So um, what, we've, what we've done over many years is to try and measure the gas accretion rates from the disk onto the star by measuring the accretion luminosity and then just equating that to the accretion rate times the gravitational potential. Okay. So if we know m and r, if we know the mass and the radius of the star, then we can get, and we measure the accretion luminosity, then we can get, a, we can get an accretion rate. And doing this then, this is kind of the, the upshot of this first part of the talk, is we get these typical accretion rates and how long stars do this, then that tells us a lower limit to how much mass there was in the disk in the first place, statistically. So why do I want to do it statistically? Why do I want to do this? Well, <clears throat> because our, our other estimates of disk masses aren't, aren't very good. So the principal way people estimate how much stuff is in the disk as they look at the dust emission at millimeter wavelengths. And so that depends upon what the opacity is of that dust. And it also depends upon not only just its optical properties or things, but just how much of the mass is in millimeter sized particles versus any other kind of size. And since millimeter sized particles are not common in the, in the uh, ISM, in the interstellar medium, Dust has, these are particles that have grown. So how far have they grown? How much mass is in bigger things in particular? We don't, we don't really know. So we, and then when you do that, then you multiply what you think the, the gas to dust ratio is. So these things, you know, they're sort of within the order of magnitude, but it's hard to know whether we can believe those at any better level than that. Uh, and the reason we use dust is that we can't see the molecular hydrogen which is the dominant mass. There are some estimates using HD, which you can see, but those things are, ac that's actually not very well advertised, but that's actually sensitive to what, you have to make a model of a disk and the temperature and density structure of the disk in order to take that, that HD measurement and put it into a, a total mass of the disk. You're not, it's not just a straightforward, I've got this much HD and therefore I've got this much H2. <clears throat> so I want to get at this in a different way. And the upshot of it is that there's, we think that based on this kind of argument, there, have to, there has to be more mass than what people are saying from other methods by a factor of a few. This is what, um, this is the kind of measurement that's done. So here's a spectrum from the UV to, to the optical. Uh, this is what a star, a typical accreting star looks like. This is what the star itself, the photosphere, is doing, and the difference is the excess. So what we're doing is we're, we're measuring, we want to measure this excess 
um, and then figure out what the accretion rate. And so I'm not going <coughs> to, there are of course uncertainties in doing this because we're not getting all wavelengths uh, uh, measured very accurately. We don't quite know the breadth of the spectrum uh, of this excess spectrum, which, is, which here is modeled uh, as this. Uh, but in any event, we, we get a number, and, and probably, if anything, we're underestimating what it is. Let me skip over that. <clears throat> so, so here's the, okay. So what do we, when we do this, what do we get? Oops, oh, well, that's, that's not the end of the talk. Um, so typically what we see then for stars that are a million years old is about two, two times 10 to the minus eight solar masses per year. And this is normalized by typical mass, in a, in a, in, and it decays with time, falls roughly like one over time. So that means then, if you, if you just integrate this up, that the total amount of mass that's accreted is about two hundredths of a solar mass. And, and depending on exactly when you start counting and when you end, uh, you end up with a number that's maybe a little bit bigger than that overall. And the point is, this is a few times, maybe three or four times the minimum mass solar nebula estimate that's made by taking the planets and putting back the hydrogen and helium you'd need to make a solar composition. And it's also a factor of two to four larger than typical dust mass estimates, given what, how people do it. So. Uh, we think that the masses are underestimated. There's more stuff to make the planets, and this is actually a good thing because when people look at exoplanet surveys and they look at how much mass is in the planets and they look at how much is in the disk, there's not enough mass in the disk to make the planets, right? And that's because the the typical way of doing this underestimates it. So the the exoplanets are the proof of this. But this is another indication statistically that, that in fact we're not doing, you know, that the other estimates are just missing some, some of the mass on the disk. Okay, so that's the total mass, but now I want to talk a little bit about where it comes from. <clears throat> now, because we can't really see, have a hard time getting the disk masses, Figuring out how the disk mass is distributed is hard, too. And so what I'm going to talk about is just kind of a, an argument for, for where, it, where we're looking at it. So uh, you can make what's called viscous disk models. Uh, and I won't go through these equations. But basically, um, what has to, what the, what in a viscous disk, you're basically turbulently moving stuff inwards to, to accrete. And the more turbulence you have, the faster it goes in. And so in a given time, you can get more, you can bring in stuff from larger radii. And this is parameterized by this thing called alpha. Okay, so uh, I'll try and make these numbers mean a little bit more, but uh, if alpha, if this efficiency parameter were as big as 10 to the minus 2, you could bring in stuff from 100 AU. You could, you could really rapidly move in the stuff from 100 AU in a million years. And, we, and I should have emphasized that our estimates of disk lifetimes are typically 3 million years before, the, before most of the... Uh, before the disk somehow disappears, where you don't see much gas or dust around the disk. Now, if you've got less turbulence, then, in fact, you're not draining out from such a large radius. You're, you're draining uh, only uh, some inner 10 astronomical units. And if you actually got to a really, really tiny viscosity, um, then you're only looking at, at draining out or pulling in from the inner astronomical unit or few astronomical units. And so what I'm going to tell you in the next slide is that something like this is more 
reasonable for a viscosity, in which case that mass that I talked to you about pulling in is not even from the whole disk, it's from the inner disk. It's, it's, it's not even, you know, the larger scale, it's actually something that's more on a 10 AU or smaller scale, which actually, of course, is pretty interesting for planets. <coughs> Excuse me. So everything that we're, we're learning in the last five to 10 years is that we think that disks aren't very turbulent and they don't have a large viscosity. Now, <clears throat> there's a magnetic instability which is very efficient at generating a turbulent viscosity, but that does not seem to work for the protoplanetary disks because there's no ion there's basically any no ionization except in very thin layers. So <clears throat> the typical thing that you know, black hole disks and, and, and cataclysmic variable disks and neutron star disks and, and supermassive black hole EGN disks, this, this just is not going to work this way. We also now have some observational evidence. So people have actually tried to look at kind of line widths in the molecular lines and say how much turbulent velocity could you have. And this is a pretty hard thing to do, uh, but the Current estimates suggest that, based that the turbulent velocities have to be less than a, a, a just a few percent of the sound speed, and if you turn this into um, some kind of estimate of alpha, it's it's less than ten to the minus th ten to the minus three or less. Um, and finally, uh, you know, anyone who's practically been around, even me, have have seen this image of HL tau with all the dark bands in it, the gaps. And so the thing is that some of these gaps are quite narrow. And it's the, th the, the, the disk is tilted, obviously, right? And so if the disk thickness were large, or even comparable to some of these gaps, you wouldn't see them. They'd be hidden, right? And so that tells you that the disk, the dust, this is dust, the dust scale height must be relatively thin, and it's thinner than what we think the gas scale height is. So the dust has settled considerably relative to the gas vertically. And that Depending on your theory, if you had more turbulence, you would loft the dust up to higher levels and, that, and you wouldn't see this. So from that, these guys argue that, in fact, you know, alpha has to be less than 10 to the minus 3. <clears throat> so just going back here very quickly, that means that the stuff that I've been telling you about, the stuff that landed on the star, made this UV optical excess, the secretion rate is actually coming from this part of the disk. It has nothing to do with the outer part of the disk. if, in fact, it's viscous. Um, <clears throat> just as a side note, people often use a, a minimum mass solar nebula not simply for the total mass, but also for the surface density at a given radius. And if you actually stick in an alpha, then this is kind of the, what you would get, assuming that you, you, you had a typical accretion rate typical fl mass flow rate going through. Um, so this by itself, if you wanted to combine this accretion rate and this alpha, you, would, you wouldn't have anywhere near a minimum mass solar. You wouldn't have that surface density at 1 AU, for better or worse. And so if you wanted to use anything like this or higher surface densities uh, to make the solar system, then you also don't want to have a lot of turbulence, and that means you, you don't want to have a lot of flow going through. So then the question is, well, okay, uh, I was pushing for higher masses, but when people make these uh, disk mass estimates, they're actually talking about trying to estimate this mass. <clears throat> 
But now I want it even in here. So can I actually put in enough stuff there? And the answer is uh, potentially yes. And this is where uh, uh, work that that uh, I it did most, you know, the fun, probably the one of the more final works uh, that we did together. Probably there was a correlation there between the final work and this paper. But anyway, um, so we just said, well, okay, um, maybe there is a low alpha. What kind of disk could we get? And uh, so this is a steady disk solution. And what we found was that as long as alpha was bigger than about 10 to the minus 4 or bigger, we could actually put in a fair amount of stuff in here. This is, at some point, you can't, you can't make any more because of gravitational instabilities, which I won't talk about. Uh, but you can, have a, you can have the accretion rate. You can have a surface density, which is a factor of several above the minimum mass solar nebula, but that's OK, because the minimum mass solar nebula is a minimum mass. And the other thing is that the, the amount of mass that we have in here that would, that would drain in on the few million, times, few million year time scale that we need to have at last, you, there was also enough mass there to do it. So in this model, basically, uh, there's a few minimum mass solar nebulae inside of 3AU. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's very hard to tell whether this would happen, whether we could test this, because everything becomes optically thick. So even without all the uncertainties in, in, in gas opacities and dust opacities, it's all optically thick. So it's hard to do this directly. Now, I've, I've told you this story about a viscous disk, but there's a completely different story about accretion where it has nothing to do with viscosity and it's a wind. So there are models now where the accretion is entirely driven by a wind. And so what happens is you, uh, you have the, the magnetic fields can couple in, in a very surface ionized layer. You shoot out stuff, that, that stuff takes away angular momentum and stuff can go in. So that's a completely different picture. Um, and in this picture, uh, you know, it, it, the fields can't do a whole lot if they don't couple to the, to the material, if you don't have any ionization. The magnetic field doesn't care if there's no ions. And so in these models, there's a thin layer where it's coupled and out here in the wind, and then the field just kind of goes through. <coughs> it doesn't have much of any effect. So what you get is you have all of the accretion occurs in a really skinny layer, surface layers of the disk. So that's, some people like that picture. You could then draw on stuff <coughs> from the entire disk. So this radius limitation that I'm talking about wouldn't come in. <coughs> but then there's not any obvious reason uh, the, the implication for, for the surface density is, is, not, is not clear, okay? I mean, even if this is doing it, my, my disk mass estimates, you know, th there has to be the mass reservoir for the accretion. No way. <clears throat> but in this picture now, where all of the accretion is just going on in these really thin layers, we have no idea what's happening in here, how much stuff there is. And so the connection between how much stuff you have and how much flow you have is completely broken. Right? You could have a lot of stuff in here, and it would empty out quickly, uh, uh, slowly. You could have hardly any stuff here. And you know, it, it would empty out quickly or so quickly or, or fast. It just depends how much stuff you started with. Right, <clears throat> so in the viscous picture, I had a connection between how much stuff I had through the disk and, and how fast it was going in. Now I don't have any connection, but uh, in this picture, this stuff isn't actually going anywhere. So if it's not going anywhere, that means it depends on how much you plop down in the first place. <clears throat> 
And so that led to us thinking about the importance of initial conditions. And what do I mean by that is, is simply, in, in order to make the star and the disk, you have some big cloud and it collapses down and it, uh, some of it goes into the star directly, some of it goes onto the disk. Probably some, clearly some of, parts of, the, some of the mass in the disk goes into the star. <coughs> Excuse me. So the infall rates that we have, this collapse, roughly free fall collapse, are typically 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 5 solar masses per year. Okay. Now I just told you that accretion rates through the disk are typically 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. And it could be, you know, early on there might be higher accretion rates and maybe you could pump it up to 10 to the minus 7. But this is bigger than this by one, two, three orders of magnitude. Okay, so it, it's, uh, I just don't understand how you can avoid stuff piling up. Unless it all lands, there's no angular momentum and it lands right on top of the tiny little 0.01 AU star, you're going to pile up stuff in the disk. Because <clears throat> the accretion isn't keeping up. And so this is a mechanism for building up a really, you know, this is an indication that maybe we should be building up really massive disks. <clears throat> and even if we're doing the wind thing, uh, you know, the wind has to get out, has to fly out, and it's got stuff coming in on top of it. So, so except maybe in the innermost parts of the disk where you've got a hot, very high velocity flow, it probably th that this stuff coming in would just quench the wind. So that's not even going to work. So, um, <clears throat> so I leaned on Jehan and he uh, did some models of this, some evolutionary, very simple evolutionary models to see how this would work, where you just basically dump stuff on with some prescription, standard prescription. Uh, and then we used, by we I mean he, uh, use these alphas here, these kind of numbers I'm talking about, kind of, you know, sort of reasonable things. And you could get, uh, you, you'd get a pile up of mass in the disk. And after all, uh, after all this stuff happens in the main infall phase, when you basically got to where we have optically visible stuff and everything's fallen into the disk, we would get our 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year and it could last for millions of years. And all of this stuff would basically be coming out from inside of 10 AU. So um, what, what I want to push is the idea that we've, you know, we typically think of minimum mass solar nebulae. Uh, we talk about models where, where there's kind of modest surface densities at 1 AU for building planets. And I think it really should take very seriously the idea that there's a lot more stuff there, typically, than people have, are, are used to using in their disk models. OK, so in the last little bit, uh, I want to talk about uh, some, some qualitative complications. And we're still, we're still working on this, but uh, I think there's some important things, lessons that we have to uh, learn from numerical, further numerical simulations, even in a very, very simple-minded way. <clears throat> so we have a picture of an idealized collapse. So we've got a nice spherical cloud that's about a solar mass or whatever, and it falls in roughly at free fall. It's got some angular momentum. So it makes a disk and a star. Uh, there's an outflow, maybe, which punches a hole, but we don't care too much about that. Um, and so this is nice and smooth and regular and axisymmetric and swell. Um, 
And this is the main thing that people do. Uh, this is generally not true. There are some objects we see that are like this, but this is generally not true. What we actually generally see, both from some observational constraints and from, from virtually every numerical simulation we make, is that the stuff comes in and, and flows in filaments. In some very weird way, this actually is sort of like, if, if you know anything about dark matter simulations, you see the cosmic web, it's kind of like this. It's more like this, more like the cosmic web. So what you have actually is, you've got a lower density thing, which may or may not be sort of spherical, but basically stuff come, tends to come in in filaments, and it tends to come in in lumps. And that's not really taken into account in this picture of adding mass onto the disk. Okay, so 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 you know. So so what's my evidence for this? I mean, I'll, I'll show you some simulations, but but forget about that. What what are, what, what are the observational evidence for this? <coughs> well, it turns out that there are biases. Uh, you know, all your observations are biased depending upon what you use for your tracer. And so for a lot of tracers, uh, all you see is some kind of larger scale thing. Um, so if you look in the gas, ga uh, gas for instance, uh, carbon monoxide or other things, you tend to see kind of like a more, more roundish thing here. These are uh, images at eight micron wavelengths, and what you're seeing are shadows. You're seeing a shadow. So there's a there's a uh, a, a thermal infrared background, just from small dust kind of hanging around, and then the really dense dust is so dense that it becomes optically thick and it blocks your view. And so this is a tracer of the really dense stuff because in order for it to have enough optical depth to make a shadow, it actually has to have a pretty high column density. <clears throat> uh, for astronomers, it basically starts at about visual extinction of 8 or 10 and goes on up. And so when you look at this, the, the, the infall is anything but spherical. So there are protostars, there are protostars in here. And you get this filament that's kind of connecting up. And this is where the dense stuff is actually coming in. Here's another example where it's a little bit um, uh, more organized. So there's a protostar in here. And there's one of these outflows that are coming out like this. And the edges of the outflow are kind of at the edges of the low density gas. So the flow uh, pushes out stuff. Uh, and it, but it is somewhat confined by the lower density envelope. So there's lower density stuff all over here. It helps confine this stuff. But the really high density stuff is over in here. <coughs> and, so it, and so exactly how it comes in uh, is, is somewhat different, and we don't really know yet just how, different, how much of a difference it makes for the standard models for adding mass onto the disk. Here are a couple of other fun examples. Uh, this is actually like a binary protostar here, and you see can all the stuff that could eventually flow, that can next fl fall in, is all on one side. Right? This is the, we think this is the rotation axis of everything. You have a disk like this, and the flow comes out perpendicular to the disk, so everything is all on one side here. Uh, here's an even uglier example. So the flow is along this, and somehow this stuff that's trying to get in is uh, not only coming in uh, on one side, but it's also kind of coming in at a, at a different angle, uh, or uh, actually almost parallel to the outflow. <coughs> so, <coughs> so this picture, this the simple picture, really doesn't quite do it. I mean, maybe it's good enough for a starting point, 
but maybe also there are some important things we're missing. So if, if we see more general things like this, then we have to start thinking about how we made this thing in the first place, right? If we just start off with something, you know, if we just start off on this scale, then it's just exactly what we put in. So what we've been trying to do is take larger scale simulations and get to the point where we start making these, these structures because, because the only way we can get to kind of in other initial conditions is trying to make larger scale initial conditions, kind of let it go and hope that we're a bigger, we have enough scale difference so that by the time we get down to the, to the, uh, uh, to the, to the protostellar core in the disk, uh, then what we did exactly at the large scale for our initial conditions won't matter that much. Okay, and when, when I say this, I'm talking about, you know, this is like a tenth of a parsec scale or smaller, and this is tens of parsec scales. So this is a work in progress. Uh, this is kind of a typical simulation of, of these things. Oops. Um, and all these little speckles are actually sink particles which we use as, as stand-ins for stars. And so you have this cloud, it's got a mess. And you get these filaments, you see. And so the, the stars in fact form kind of in filaments. And flows that come in are also going to be along the filaments. And you see this all the time in everybody's simulation. This is, this is just our version of it. Everybody else who does this, if they actually look at it carefully, they get, they get filaments. They don't, you know, it's, it's universal. And so this is a complicated thing here, and we're, we're st this is still in progress. But this is a plot of the mass flux into our, into our sink. Actually, it's into the vicinity of the sink, into the, into the protostellar core. And what you see is that um, there are episodes where uh, the mass flux can, can, can increase by one or two orders of magnitude. So when I told you that there was kind of like an average rate coming in, it now looks like we should have big lumps and, and, and quiescent periods. Um, and this is, this is associated with uh, the, the filaments, the dense parts, if, if the sink or the accreting object kind of starts flowing into these things, then there's a big bump. And if it kind of wanders away a little bit from the filament, then, then everything kind of shuts off. Uh, so we're still in the early days of doing this. And if, of course, the other thing we'd like to know is how the angular momentum is changing. Because it's not just the total amount of stuff that's coming in, but the amount of angular momentum and even its direction is fluctuating on hundreds of thousands of years time scale going, going into the, and possibly more because we're not resolving it. This is just another <clears throat> plot of this completely different simulation. Uh, and all I'm trying to show is that uh, th there's the accreting particle in here. The red stuff is what's going to come in, in the next, uh, in the next time step. And this is a different time step. So this is where it starts. You make it. And then you can see you've got these streams coming in, and they have different amounts of mass in them, and they have different amounts of angular momentum. And so what we, need to, what we want to do in the near term is to see how that time variation actually, how much the time variation occurs, how much mass bumps we get, how much fluctuations in the angular momentum. It could actually really. Um, make a huge difference to the, to the disk, the protoplanetary disk that you, you finally end up with. So this is still in progress, and we've got a long ways to go. But I just wanted to mention that this is a mess. And <clears throat> also that in addition to having lumps coming in, theoretically, we actually see lumps coming into the star observationally in a few objects where, where this, is, this is just brightness. and this. And these are basically just increases in the accretion rate onto the star by three or four orders of magnitude. Um, 
And so we see a few of these things. And, and as a side note, this thing here is a, has a central star that's pretty much obliterated by this disk coming in of three-tenths of a solar mass. And since 1937, it has accreted a minimum mass solar nebula. Just, just in a century. Anyway, so this is, this is the summary uh, of this. I've talked about a bunch of stuff. But basically, the, the takeaway is that when we look at estimates of how much mass gets added to the star during the few million year time scale in which protoplanets, we think protoplanets form, and it's getting faster all the time, that that indicates that we're, really, that we're underestimating our mass reservoirs by a factor of a few. And that's good, because then there's enough stuff to make the exoplanets. Um, the how, where this stuff actually comes from, is it coming from uh, all of the disk or just the inner disk, is something that's still uh, hard to determine or hard to prove. But it certainly has a big effect on, on, on uh, on uh, the potential, for example, making very compact exoplanet systems like we see in the, some of the Kepler systems. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, we have a whole lot of investigation that we need to do to understand when we don't have a nice smooth buildup of the disk, when actually stuff is plopping in and comes in at, at funny angles that change over time, how that actually affects the disk how it sets up the mass distribution of the disk, how that might affect fragmentation. Uh, all of these things are, are, are going to re require a lot more work, but hopefully we'll make some progress on that theoretically in the next several years, and then go back and look at observations like I showed you of the, of the shadows uh, to try and see if we can actually reproduce that stuff. <clears throat> so I, th I think I'm done. Thanks, thanks for your attention. Well, it's, it's, it's basically like a several thousand solar mass cloud. So then you're making, you know, dozens of, dozens of solar mass things. Pardon? Uh, well, that's the next step. The problem that we're having is that uh, on a related paper, uh, we we had a we had a referee that was difficult, so we were. Um, <clears throat> but that but that's the next that's the next step. So so hopefully in the next month or so we'll have the first magnetic simulations. We could, these what I've shown you now is just the just the non-magnetic case. Sorry. Uh, so uh, we're using Athena. So for for the moment, uh, work with uh, Fabian Heitch. We were worried about the, uh, the, uh, the mesh refinement codes and how they handle the magnetic fields. So we're going to do the fixed grid. Athena is known to handle the magnetic fields quite well. I mean, this is, this is now ideal MHD. So you know, make it. And then after we do that, then we can, we can try some of the, you know, like flash or some of the other things and see you know, if it looks completely different or if at least it, it matches up. I mean, the, the AMR is better because then we can go to smaller scales than we can with the fixed grid. But uh, we're trying to be conservative about how we start off on the large scales. So can you go back to the layered accretion of Yeah. There's no way. <laughs> oh, this is not a disk wind case. This, this, this is this is a thing that Johanna and I did with a viscous disk, where, where this is the alpha. So, so what happens here is that that um, 
uh, we use a simple axisymmetric model of infall, plop stuff down on the disk, and then uh, how much it piles up uh, depends upon the viscosity, or if it starts getting gravitationally unstable, then we, then we let it redistribute from that. Right. So the, the disk wind case, right? So you're basically, you have stuff flying off here, and this is, so this part is coupled to the field, and this part, and this, this part isn't, right? And so you get flows that are just along here, and they're actually pretty fast. They're kind of like a fraction of a sound speed in these surface layers and these models. Right? And so then you've got this pretty high velocity. In order to have the accretion rate, if you have no mass, you have to have a high velocity to get it. Right? So you have all this stuff in these pictures. You have those stuff zooming in in these thin layers, right? because just outside of this layer, it's flying out. And here it's going in, and here it's not doing anything. Right? So then there's no connection directly. Right. Of the simulation. Right. So uh, broadly, do you have a take on that? Should you know, do you notice different things depending on stellar temperature? Well, we haven't we haven't put that in because basically, what that does is it affects um, it affects the genes mass and what mass you end up with, right? Um, So these are these at the moment they're just isothermal. We're just kind of look at the larger scale stuff coming in. The problem with Matthew's simulations is that um, we don't know what the protostellar luminosity should be because you can say, all right, if I've got this mass protostar, it should be like a star and should have this luminosity. But if it were actually accreting at ten to the minus six solar mass or 10 to the minus 5 solar masses, it would be like 10 or 100 times more luminous. Uh, and so that would be a much bigger effect. And then the question is, uh, we don't see that. So, so there's this problem that we have where we don't really see enough luminosity to account for the accretion. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about is whether a lot of it just comes in a very fast bursts that are very high luminosity, but spends most of the time at low luminosity. So I mean, it's a reasonable thing for, f to think about, because if you don't put in some kind of thermal physics, uh, you don't get a peak in the mass function. But exactly how that works, there's still a bunch of fudging, because right? you don't know the accretion luminosity. Uh-oh. It, I think it gets photo evaporated eventually. I mean, the thing that I haven't talked about is that the, the accretion rates seem to fall off a cliff at some age. And I'm thinking more and more that, that's either photo evaporation, but I think more and more it's actually uh, giant planets forming, cutting off, the, cutting off the accretion flow into the inner disk. Trunk, you know, making a hole in the inner disk. But that's not, I don't, that's not been observationally demonstrated very well. So I, you think the transition is kind of like at the end of the series? Yeah. Something has to happen. It can't just be viscous evolution or even, you know, it's hard even with the photo evaporation, which, in fact, you know because you tried that in one of, one of, one of your other many papers. Thank <laughs> you.